All right. Welcome, everyone. You are, you are uh, about to embark on a fun journey with us today. This is one of the most uh, uh, probably different sessions that you'll, that you'll have at reInvent. We're going to uh, cycle through a whole bunch of presentations in a very short period of time. So hopefully you're along for the ride. We've got, uh, so hopefully you also notice that this is a 400 level session. So we're gonna expect that you have a pretty good working knowledge of AWS and jump straight into the tech in each of these situations. So um, as I'm sure most of you know, we have a ton of different storage solutions at AWS, different services, different uh, ways to get data in and out of AWS as well as lots of different tools to help you manage and secure your data. So each of the folks that are, that are coming up here today are gonna to be focusing on how they have implemented things from this portfolio and from outside of it in, in the larger AWS environment, in the community, um, to, to build these solutions that solve a specific problem in their environment. So what we'll have is seven to 10 minute sort of TED Talk style presentations. We're gonna hear from Alert Logic. We're gonna hear from iRobot, from Celgene, from Viber, and from in situ, and lots of cool things. If you haven't heard of some of these companies, I encourage you to stick around and listen to exactly what it is they do because each one of them has a really cool use case for how they're, how they're deploying on AWS storage. And so with that, Without further ado, I'm going to welcome uh, Paul Fisher to the stage and ask him to uh, tell us about his solution at Alert Logic. All right, thank you very much. So let's uh, jump right into it. So what we do at Alert Logic, just briefly, is we provide uh, integrated 24 by 7 security protection for cloud workloads, everything from intrusion detection to WAF to vulnerability scanning. You can come see our booth. Um, at the Expo Hall. But really what I'm here to talk about is what we did around the S3 and related technologies to implement a fairly large scale system and then to scale it up to 100 times our current production volume built on top of the S3 storage technologies. So we have about 4,000 customers. We run an average of 2 point, uh, or 1.2 million messages a second. It peaks at about 3 million messages a second. We bring in two petabytes per month of customer data. That's anywhere from three months to seven years data retention on a per customer or per data type basis. And the data volume grows faster than the customer acquisition rate. It grows at an additional 110% every year. So it, it escalates fairly quickly. As we move further into customers with AWS workloads, there are additional data types that will raise that growth even higher. Flow data, for example, will will add probably 20 or 30% more growth on top of that as we move forward, analyzing it for security outcome. So the big problems that we face in you know, sort of what we've built around storage technologies is doing performance durability availability all at the same time is actually a challenge. Doing that in a multi-region um, situation where you can have a whole region or part of a region go down and have the customer up and running in, within 15 minutes in the alternative region, scaling the initial implementation that you run production on up to over 150 times that uh, the volume that we run today, and then doing all of this at less than two cents per gigabyte per month, which ends up for us, we have a long history of running stuff in a colo and moving to uh, AWS, that ended up being half the cost overall, the co total blended cost of the multi-region, multi, uh, you know, high availability solution. This is our system um, on the green stuff is sort of customer environments that we bring data in from. Stuff on the, you know, on the right hand side is partner environments that we flow data out of. We have partners that actually take the full ingestion rate of all of their customers and then they do their own an analytics on top of what we deliver as sort of an enhanced service offering. That whole flow of data from customer environments in through our system and then the storage thereof and then flow out is part of this ingestion storage and access subsystem that you can see in the middle is one of those boxes. The rest of them are subsystems that run our system that I'm not going to talk about, but if we dig into that ingestion storage access subsystem, it's made up of a couple of services. The one I'm 
going to drill into is what we call data access. It's not a very inventive name, but it is exactly what it does. Fundamentally, it stores all the data, it manages all the data, and it provides interfaces for doing ad hoc based uh, analytics and search for the rest of our system. It does all of the management um, of that data uh, as part of its implementation, naturally, and it's built in a way that is multi-region and high availability. So if you look on the left-hand side, we've got a diagram of two AWS regions. You've got a set of uh, S3 buckets for each data type. Those buckets are then um, arranged so that we put 950 customers per bucket because, as I said before, we need to do retention periods on a per customer basis. So you write 950 lifecycle rules for each of uh, you know for each of those customers for a month so that you can basically expire the data. You write storage class tiering rules then to be able to tear down the data to infrequent access. And then in the backup region, we then write that stuff into infrequent access directly and then tear it down to Glacier. Those rules all pivot around two tags. So when object tagging was uh, released last year, that was the impetus for us to build this system and actually move this core storage and processing system over to AWS. Simple tags, so you can see the rules uh, on the right-hand side that we do for expiration is the top little segment. That's one customer's expiration rule. And the bottom segment is a storage tiering rule for the primary region. So we run this pair of regions. They actually have customers as primary in each of them. They bi-directionally replicate. The thing to note is that there's also a set of um, KMS keys, one per data type, that is generated. We then use that to generate data keys. We, sign, we then use that to encrypt all the data. The primary region uses the backup region's uh, KMS key to generate a data key. All those data keys are written so that we have one key per customer per month. So the blast radius of every encryption key is just one customer one month. And those are just written in the primary region. We then use CRR to replicate all of the data files and the key files over to the backup region. At the same time, there's Dynamo tables that keep track of the, the buckets that are being created for a given data type, and then the customer assignments to those buckets. Those have DDB streams turned on. We had to connect Lambda functions to those, because there's a little bit of, it's not a direct replication. Um, there's a little bit of swizzling that goes on to write it into the alternative region. What this sets us up to do is at, when I talked about that 15 minute uh, RTO, it sets us up to just simply redirect the traffic to the backup region and start servicing requests, because the first month is in infrequent access. Stuff that's there for longer, that's in Glacier, that request will cause us to issue a rapid recall. It will tell the caller to come back later. They'll come back later, and the data is there. And so our, our DR solution is part of an active, active uh, arrangement of just sort of putting these pieces together and setting it up so that it replicates the parts to the alternative region. And then we set up sets of these regions for what we call a data residency zone so that we can have multiple of these pairs running uh, customers. What's, you know, I think the thing really to take away from this is that these pieces, very simple uh, Kinesis streams for queuing up the work and Lambda functions for then doing the DDB replication, it didn't, doesn't take a lot if you just build on top of these basic pieces of infrastructure to get done a fairly sophisticated system that has, you know, a pretty rapid recovery time, even if you have a whole region go down. So the last thing I wanted to highlight is we have a need to bring data in rapidly, get it put down in the system, and then process real time um, for reasons because data comes in, different timestamps, uh, clocks are wrong, um, it takes a delay in collecting the data, whatever happens. We end up with lots of little files. So we run what we call a bundling routine that just runs off of a simple inventory report. That inventory report is analyzed by a Lambda function kicked off by the inventory report being written in a notification. That Lambda function will, will pour through the report, punching out records into an SQS queue to say, go reorganize this particular 15 minutes of information into a bundle. And then if it runs out of time, it'll reschedule itself. And it just keeps running until it makes it through the whole report. 
Then there's another lambda that reads uh, the SQS queue, and all it does is does groups of receive message, executes lambda functions with the uh, read receipts, and then those lambda functions actually then perform the, the bundling, the sort of gathering together and writing of the new files. You know, because an SQS queue has the ability to run 125,000 simultaneous uh, outstanding messages from the queue, the parallelism for any given set of reorganization here is, you know, pretty high, something that would be difficult to engineer otherwise. So these pieces that we've put together really has allowed us in very rapid succession to build a system that was unattainable before, but was actually fairly easy. In fact, uh, myself and just one engineer in three months put together the initial core of the system, and now we have a team that's operating this and doing the very large-scale multi-redundancy work on it to you know, make it into what it, is, uh, you know, what it is that I'm presenting. Anything? So Paul has a great case study up on uh, at, the, at the URL below, but if you don't want to take the time to write that down, just hit the S3 homepage and you can see a little bit more about, about the cool stuff that they're doing at Alert Logic. So now we'll shift gears a little bit and I want to, I want to focus on IoT and welcome Jim Teal from iRobot to the stage. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, so today um, what I'm going to talk to you about is one part of our IoT workload. Uh, in my role at iRobot, we're working on uh, the, the analytics flow of data coming off of the, um, AOS, uh, AWS IoT, and this uh, workload is just one part of that solution. Um, the problem that we had initially when we were designing, we, we migrated from a different IoT provider to, um, to AWS about a year, a little bit over a year ago, and uh, in doing so, we designed a solution that was based on EMR and DynamoDB, and um, a whole bunch of other parts of the uh, AWS uh, ecosystem. And we ran into one consistent problem, and it was really more uh, not on scale from a throughput perspective, but scale on a cost perspective. And in the consumer IoT space, we're very um, constrained on cost. You know, you, c customers aren't paying for that connected service. It's part of the ecosystem uh, that they're expecting these upgrades, they're expecting these features, and um, we, you know, we need a way um, to cost effectively provide those features. And this one workflow that I'm gonna talk about, or this one data flow, um, was difficult to support in a cost-effective fashion. Um, so um, what we needed to do was kind of rethink um, and how we could refactor the solution to be more cost-effective. And what we had hoped when we looked at this is that we could take this solution that was, uh, was certainly scalable if we, if we wanted to spend more money, uh, but cost-reduce it and get similar performance um, and reduce costs by at least 50%. And thankfully, we were able to more than, uh, uh, more than achieve that goal. Uh, so one of the things that we're, um, we're really um, focused on uh, at iRobot is making sure, like I said, that the, the cost performance um, is, is well managed. And we also really are hyper-focused on minimizing DevOps. Uh, we currently are supporting um, you know, hundreds of thousands of consumer robots, and we, um, we have a DevOps team of two, <laughs> um, and uh, that's a, a pretty amazing scale factor, and we wanted to make sure that this one workload didn't push that further outside of um, our, uh, the realm. So, uh, you know, we were hyper-focused on trying to look at what could we do to uh, manage the cost, to reduce the, the cost to DevOps, and uh, overall reduce um, risk and uh, increase reward. Uh, so, like I said, as part of the process before, we were looking at DynamoDB. That was our single most expensive component in the solution. Uh, as we looked month over month, um, those costs were, were going uh, up in a hockey stick, and uh, we needed to find a way to, um, to get a, um, an alternative. So this is what we're looking at now as, as, the, as the production workload is kind of simplified. We're looking at, um, on the left-hand side, AWS IoT. Uh, we're using uh, the um, rules within IoT to then trigger stuff to go off into Kinesis, and then the consumption um, is happening on the on the right. Um, the uh, so that you know the basically the rules and stuff didn't change on the, on the left, but when we transitioned, we did a, a, a huge change um, on, on the right side. So two things: this uh, this production workload is designed to support two major use cases. 
Uh, the first is that it's supporting our customer service um, uh, people so that if a customer calls in and is having a problem, they can look at the historical states of, from the IoT platform. Uh, AWS IoT st keeps the current state. Um, we need to be able to look at the historical state. What was the state of the robot at a point in time? Did someone enable a feature that changed its behavior? Um, was there a problem and do we know what it is? So just knowing the current state of AWS IoT isn't enough. We need to know the, the, um, the changes over time. And uh, this work, uh, uh, this uh, flow is really um, geared towards collecting that data and, and preserving it. What we're doing now uh, here is we have a kind of a two-pronged approach. Uh, our, our initial goal was really to replace uh, EMR, to replace uh, Dynamo, and, and ideally go directly um, with landing files in S3 and um, having uh, Athena point to the, those buckets and just be done with it. And of course, we knew it wouldn't be that simple. Uh, so then uh, when we realized that we weren't going to get the performance with just landing JSON files from AWS IoT to these, um, to these buckets, we had to rethink how we could um, optimize the process and still keep a lot of the benefits of um, an Athena-based solution. So um, what we've uh, done here is we have kind of have a bifurcated approach. Um, as soon as live data is coming in, we're sending that to Elasticash. And that's to help with the response of the, of the um, uh, call center agent. So if, if they're on the phone, they're gonna be able to look at what's happening near real time uh, through the Elasticash. And then from there, what we're doing in the back end is more of the past historical states. We're going through and doing optimization. We're taking the, the JSON, uh, very potentially small, some medium-sized messages from the IoT platform. We're, um, we're optimizing those. We're, we're bundling them together. We're um, putting them into a, um, a Parquet file and using Snappy to kind of get the most optimization we can. And we're also doing our own partitioning of that data to get it into um, a highly efficient queryable form for Athena. And that's all happening with that kind of main middle flow. And then well, as a parallel, we're taking all the, uh, the whatever heavy lifting we're doing and we're also funneling that over to Redshift for other, um, other query access. So the ideal thing here is that you know, a customer calls in if they do have a problem um, or someone's managing our, the fleet with the fleet management console calling the same API. Um, the, the call is being made near um, the last hour of data is being sourced out of Elasticache. Um, the rest of the, of the query is going in against Athena to look at the historical states for the period of time that they were asked. And um, we're serving up the response uh, through, uh, through JSON, through uh, our robot data API, which is um, backed by um, the API gateway. And uh, you know, what we've seen is uh, we've been able to, by changing uh, the approach, by looking at the uh, different mix of tools uh, and components, um, we uh, had the goal of reducing costs by 50%. Uh, we were actually able to get down to closer to 10 to 12% um, of the original cost, um, which is a huge um, benefit for us in being able to um, add more features and get more scale um, as we go forward. Um, so that's... Uh, uh, that's what I had to show, share with you today. Great. So iRobot has a couple of other sessions. If this piqued your interest, uh, they're, they're on the screen here. Uh, feel free to sign up for those. We're, we're reserving about 25% of every room So if you want to uh, for, for walk-ups. So if you want to get into one of those sessions, you have a really good chance to just sign up for them in the app. Also, we have a great landing page that will help you with all things IoT at aws.amazon.com slash IOT. Now let's shift gears again and go to a totally different industry. And I'm going to welcome Lance Smith from Celgene on the stage to talk about how they've migrated their HPC infrastructure into AWS. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lance Smith. I'm here from my uh, Celgene Corporation. Um, what we do, we are a pharmaceutical company from manufacturing, R&D, commercial, and sales. Uh, like many companies, we started just easy into uh, Amazon, started with the EC2, S3, and then as the years went on, we started diving deeper and deeper into the services. Around 2015, one of the business areas, R&D, went all in, um, spent an enormous amount of money on the Direct Connect, and that just triggered a huge avalanche into serverless commute and other areas of Amazon. Um, overall, as a company, we do have a cloud-first strategy, so all applications now coming in are um, uh, cloud first, uh, but historically we are a COTS shop, 
We have 600 applications that are enterprise grade at our company, 500 of which have been purchased and we have no control over code, configuration, et cetera. Uh, the application I'm gonna talk to today uh, is an HPC application that we purchased from a vendor. Um, the on-premise hardware was no longer scalable. Our scientists, our users were not very happy with performance. And they wanted to move to a, a dynamic and elastic system where they can rapidly ramp up CPU usage and then um, get faster productivity. <clears throat> the application challenges we had for this particular application, it was not made for the cloud. Uh, the code base was really coming out of the 1990s, very thick client, uh, very, 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 very intensive CPU-wise. We could not make any application code changes, like I said before, but we want to refactor this application to run in Amazon. We did not want to forklift it uh, and because of for data protection. Um, if we move it up there, we were afraid that it would fall down. Now, where this application fits in our entire life cycle is that pre, it, it starts before the drug discovery process. So anything we can do for this particular application ultimately speeds up our uh, creation of cures for our patients. Uh, this particular application run, jobs would run about six to eight weeks. Very, very long time. And our user base, you know, that's not good enough. Uh, for a particular individual, you know, they could only run theoretically 10 of these jobs a year. But it's a multi-user system. Realistically, with other jobs, they could do this once or twice in a given year. And that made a huge commitment from the user. If I could only run this piece of software once a year, I had to be very, very sure that the parameters I put in for my simulations were, very, were good. They couldn't crash. Um, by moving to Amazon, we brought this down to less than a day. And that not only speeds up our drug discovery process and our cures for our cancer patients, but it also had an unintended benefit that we didn't even anticipate. Our scientists would launch the job, they would get the results back in a day, then they could experiment. Like, what if I put these parameters into this job? What if I did this? And they could, that was an ability they did not have before. And just by the scale of Amazon, we could bring the cost of failure down to zero. Whereas previously, that if they screwed up, that was the end. <clears throat> um, this is our particular architecture we have. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see our on-premise file system. It's a 250 terabyte. Uh, GPFS file system, it's a little old, 160,000 IOPS, and, and that worked for the, the, the cluster that we had on premise there, uh, about 10 to 20 nodes depending on the type of job. And then when we first moved to Amazon, uh, we, we didn't want to run a parallel file system. That was a lot of work, a lot of maintenance, a lot of risk to us. So what we decided to do was to put uh, NFS server there, uh, and that definitely came with some challenges. Um, uh, NFS box could not you know, handle tens or hundreds of nodes. But with the auto-scaling group, we gradually ramped up uh, computational nodes as the calculations came in, and that eased the workload on the storage. Uh, that worked for a little bit of time. However, our business soon found out that the auto-scaling group could add a zero, add another zero. All of a sudden, you know, instead of 10 nodes, 100 nodes, you had 1,000 nodes hitting our storage subsystem. And that just brought the entire system to its knees, and it made it very unstable. So we had to dial back uh, the CPU usage and that, that increased runtime for our users. They're very, very happy. But that's, that's when EFS came out, went GA. Very, very happy that came out. That really solved a lot of problems for us. By switching out NFS, we doubled performance on the per node and overall throughput of the system. And it made it much more stable. Um, it, the biggest impact to us as an IT organization is we no longer have an NFS server to maintain. We don't have to patch it and it doesn't crash. Previously, we would get messages, NFS server crashed, oh, dang it, we had to go fix that. Uh, we need more storage. We have to get, you know, provision more volumes. What we did not want to do is create a, a Stripe EBS RAID, RAID set. Uh, you can't snapshot that. You will lose data guaranteed sooner or later. So we have a single volume provisioned IOPS previously, switch that to EFS, uh, and, and we're great. Um, we use two different types of uh, EFS volumes, slash home uh, is general, general purpose. For, for low latency, for the small files. Our large genomic work, uh, workloads are running on max IO. Slightly higher latency, however, individual files are 30 to 50 gigabytes, and 1,000 nodes are pulling data from that, and we need that uh, max O capability. Uh, our biggest issue has been job control, but now that we solved that, um, it you know, replaced the storage subsystem. Um, that's it. Great. Thank you, Lance. Lance is also presenting tomorrow if you want to learn a little bit more about Celgene's infrastructure in STG 310. 
So we're going to switch, switch gears again, and let's, let's now welcome Amir Shalom from Viber Corporation up on the stage. Uh, Amir's been building, and, and, his and, and his team has been working with him to build a, uh, an analytics solution that scales with their business and, and revolves around a data lake that lives in AWS storage. And so I want to have him tell you a little bit more about that. Amir? Yeah, thank you, Robbie. So I've, <clears throat> sorry. I've been with uh, Viber for uh, about six years, which is uh, almost from the beginning. Viber is um, a messaging app. While less popular maybe in the US, there are some countries where it is the most popular messaging app there, sometimes even more popular than Facebook. Viber, in contrast to many messaging apps, is completely end-to-end -end encrypted for all of its data and media and has full multi-device support. In 2017, Rakuten, our parent company, uh, became the official sponsor for uh, FCB Barcelona and the NBA Golden State Warriors. So we're very happy with that partnership because uh, Viber became the official communications platform and messaging app for those uh, teams. We got jerseys and everything. <laughs> Um, these teams basically use that uh, for public accounts that they have with millions of followers, and they also have chatbots which allow uh, users to go and pick the MVP of the games and uh, share their experiences. But let's talk a little bit about uh, what we do behind the scenes. Uh, I'd like to show you a short video uh, showing what happens in Viber in just uh, 60 seconds. Oops, how do we play that? Does it play on uh, the computer? There we go. Okay, so Viber is uh, what's called a planetary scale uh, application with close to a billion users uh, in almost every single country around the world. Uh, we have between 10 to 15 billion events daily, uh, peaking at over 300,000 events per second uh, from our users. Uh, we store about five petabytes of data on S3 and Glacier. Uh, and our production uh, database is a NoSQL database called Couchbase which is uh, doing over 2 million operations per second on 20 terabytes of data in memory with 35 billion keys. Now, in order to handle all of these events, we have to make a pretty robust uh, data backend system uh, architecture, and I'd like to go over that a bit with you guys. So what you can see here uh, in our architecture is that we have our uh, backend servers, which are churning out events uh, to our uh, data architecture. We're using our real-time data pipeline is Kinesis, uh, which has two consumers. One is for the raw events. Uh, we use uh, Kinesis Firehose with Lambda transformations to back that up to S3. Uh, S3 is holding basically all of our data lake. Everything is stored in the same uh, S3 area. And uh, we have our, uh, from the data pipeline, uh, we also have our real-time data processor, which is Apache Storm. This is processing all the events in uh, near real time. Uh, th this is used for a few things. We're both uh, using the events for uh, consumers that require real-time access to events, such as uh, spam handling uh, and things like that, and also updating a uh, profile database of our users, which again is using Couchbase. And the storm is also basically storing all of the data. It's fanning out the data into the different event types on our data lake on S3. Then from S3, we have all kinds of ETL jobs uh, using Spark, Presto, Pig, Lambda functions, things like that, which are basically taking all this data, doing all kinds of analytics, aggregations, and putting them back into our data lake. Uh, some of this data is also loaded into data warehousing and databases like Aurora and uh, Redshift. And we also have uh, different query engines, which normally use the data directly on S3 or on our databases. Uh, we use both Presto, Athena, uh, Spark SQL and uh, Pig. 
Uh, and finally, we have our reporting tools like Tableau and uh, more uh, freestyle stuff like Redash and Zeppelin uh, for uh, displaying this stuff. Now, I'd like to dive into one specific uh, challenge that we had uh, when implementing this uh, data lake uh, architecture. We have about 300 different uh, event types that are going into our uh, system. Uh, we have uh, some of these events are high throughput events, uh, peaking out at over 50,000 uh, events per second, and others come in only once every few minutes. Uh, now, they're all going in through the same Kinesis stream, uh, and Storm is basically uh, fanning them out into uh, different uh, directories in high partitioning. So it's going into like a year, month, day, hour uh, directory structure. And what happens is that uh, the smaller event types are going uh, and becoming very, very small files. Uh, and then when we query, let's say, a range of a few months of data for these small event types, we were getting to, let's say, 15,000 TPS on a single S3 bucket. Uh, this was causing throttling in 5xx events. Uh, and the problem is it wasn't only throttling that Presto cluster. It was throttling everything on our uh, single S3 uh, bucket, which is our data lake. Uh, so all of our ETL jobs, uh, Storm, which is writing the events, all of these were throttled uh, as well. So we had to find a solution quite fast for that. So what we did is uh, the first stage was basically to concatenate the, the, the small files into uh, larger files, optimally over 100 megabytes if possible. Uh, we used an AWS tool called S3 DiscCP, which is a distributed tool which uh, takes files from S3 and writes them back, basically. Um, and uh, the second part was to convert the files into a columnar uh, file format, uh, like Parquet or ORC. In our case, we chose Parquet, which is a little bit more popular, but both are great. Uh, we spun up an EMR cluster uh, using Spark, and that does the conversion uh, to Parquet. Uh, this uh, this two-stage uh, solution basically helped reduce the amount of requests that we had by one to two orders of magnitude and basically solved our problem. Uh, but we were, see we're still seeing a little bit of higher latency until the files are uh, completed on our data lake. Uh, so what we're working on now is basically creating a little bit better solution of converting uh, and concatenating in a single process. Uh, we're checking out either using... Uh, uh, an EMR cluster with Spark for that, or maybe the new managed service uh, from Amazon for the ETL called Glue, uh, which might also be a solution for that. A few other things that we want to do to optimize our solution is to uh, partition our uh, directory for format a little bit differently. As I said before, we're using currently the uh, standard Hive partitioning, uh, and we can use the reverse partitioning. The reason for reversing the partitioning of using hour, day, month, year instead of the opposite is that it would uh, distribute it better on the physical S3 partitions and that we could get a higher TPS um, from our requests. Uh, another optimization that we're thinking of doing and uh, checking out is uh, basically using larger files for higher throughput events uh, in order to improve the solution even more. So, thank you. Thanks, Amir. We've got a couple of other sessions. If you want to deep dive into data lakes and the storage track, these are happening both right here at the Venetian over the next couple of days. So make sure and note these and, uh, and clear some time on your schedule. These are going to be great sessions. You'll also get a, get a deeper dive from Amir in that session as well as some of the data scientists at Airbnb. And, for, and we'll switch industries one more time into the aerospace industry. And I want to uh, welcome Rahul Thakkar and uh, Stephen Hoffert from in situ. And they're, they're going to give us a totally different look at what we see from, from aerospace and how they're, how they're using uh, the AWS Snowball Edge for some really cool edge applications. Oh, here you go. That's the clicker. Check, check. Not bad. Uh, so probably my neighbor might be, my next door neighbor actually happens to be here. If he's in this room, I'd, not yet, okay. Well, hi. Um, My name's Rahul Thakkar. I'm the director of commercial cloud at uh, In-Situ Commercial. In-Situ has two parts, uh, defense and, and uh, their commercial arm. And uh, we are part of the, the, the commercial team here. Um, 
and this is uh, Stephen Hofford. He's a uh, member of the special projects team. Uh, we are, today's discussion, we want to talk about the human factor, uh, not just technology, on how we used, how we used uh, the technology to, to, to solve a very real problem, which is one, um, focus on, on helping human beings do their job safely. That was one of the most important things. So what is in situ? Right? Now I'm going to hand the mic. Uh, um, so In-Situ in is, is a subsidiary of Boeing. We make um, medium endurance unmanned aircraft and provide end-to-end -end services around, um, around those, both in, in, in defense and commercially. And um, you, you may have heard of Captain Phillips' story in the movie. And that aircraft that you see flying around, that's, that's our unmanned aircraft. That's the one we make. And there are tons of stories that we can we can talk about after after the session if you're interested, but um, Institute is a great place um, that has done a lot of work, and and you know the aircraft has covered over a million hours. It's you know flies hundreds of kilometers, flies for 12 to 24 hours, and collect, collect, uh, collects terabytes of data. Um, and uh, Steve. Thank you, Rahul. So, uh, as Rahul said, I'm the integration lead for commercial cloud at Institute. So, uh, if our customers have a specific cloud integration problem they're looking to solve, then my team can can help them tackle that. So, from battles, you know, on the battlefield to natural disasters such as storms, hurricanes, wildfires, and additional monitoring of a lot of critical infrastructure. Uh, as a company, in situ. Uh, is always looking to pioneer and innovate in everything that we do to bring value to positively affect people's lives and potentially change the course of history. So recently, within the last couple of years, we've set up our commercial business unit. So in situ commercial is a new business unit of in situ that's looking to take all of our uh, technology, our products, our services, and leverage them for large commercial enterprises. So our customers really don't care about cloud. They don't care about S3, they don't care about EFS, they, what they care about is something totally different. Um, they care about answers for very simple queries. Um, they have wellheads in the oil and gas industry, right? Um, those wellheads are pumping gas or whatever stuff they are pumping out. Um, they want to know if it is leaking. Right? They, they, is it broken? Is there vegetation encroachment? It's, um, you know, is the gate open? Uh, for, you know, maybe animals can get in. Um, are valves, valves are popped, or um, is there rust, subsidence in a huge pile of ore the size of this building? Um, is, is um, you know, there are so many other issues. So drones, that's not something they care about. They care about that specific problem. And by providing these answers at scale, uh, it results in huge cost savings. And at the end of the day, if it saves them money, it saves us money because we are consuming that energy. Right? So it's something, you know, something that we kind of valued. And in addition, we, we are working hard to save lives during disasters. So the same aircraft that can you know, be used in, in, in a combat situation can be used to monitor fires, forest fires. It can be used to, to direct and, and monitor fire and map fire lines so that uh, those who are working towards um, controlling that fire are not in as much harm's way. Um, and you know, we can do a much better job, hopefully, in, in controlling those fires and uh, save lives again. Um, we support a fair bit of uh, unmanned aircraft. There are about two of our own and a few others. Um, and a modality, a vast modality of sensors and data types. So, you know, when people think of sensors, it's just cameras and, and, and video, but it's n not just that. It's a lot more. Um, imagine capturing a fair portion of the electromagnetic spectrum in very large quantities. That's the kind of work we do. Now, you take that data, you process it. The, the, the problem, so that's the part you do in the cloud, right? But we're not going to talk about the cloud. We're going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about what happens when this data is captured on the ground. Was that data captured right? Did we do a good job getting it? Did, do we have to fly again? That was the problem uh, we were trying to solve uh, as part of our work this year. And, 
And uh, um, let's see. So um, when we when we uh, started looking at the problem, right? Uh, where are you? You're in the middle of nowhere. You're in the Australian outback. You are literally in the middle of nowhere. There is a lot of risk to lives. Um, you know, when people literally drive to these these wellheads, you have 50, 100, whatever number of people barely covering a few gas wellheads. So, um, you know, e even, if, uh, even if a drone and unmanned aircraft flies, they're collecting terabytes of data, right? And it results, um, you know, the results come, they take days to come by, right? And a lot of times you still have to go back and solve the same problem over and over again. So our challenge was to use unmanned assets to minimize the risk to people, do, you know, maybe 10x amount of coverage. So instead of covering 10 wellheads, do 100. That's where uh, you know, scale comes to play. Uh, move the data into the cloud, reduce the time to result down to hours rather than days. And of course, reduce the cost. So the, the, the diagram here is quite simple because uh, we wanted to look at it as simply as we possibly could. You know, the, the aircraft flies, it collects terabytes of data in a single mission. You know, a smaller data set is about 30 terabytes. Um, then you literally drive it to the nearest data center, right? You transfer it into a rack of machines in your back office and do some pretty heavy duty processing on it. You get your results. And then finally, you can look at your results and start your an analysis. And you can get your answers back pretty quick. It's great. It's wonderful. Stuff breaks. Computers break. What are you going to do about that? You, know, you need more machines. You need more storage. You need old data to be processed along with the new data sets. Suddenly, scale becomes a problem. And even if you take this data and you move it to the cloud, it still takes a fair amount of time before you realize, oops, something went wrong. Your data was not right here to fly again. And uh, Steve's going to talk about the costs. So yeah, um, like Rahul said, if you spend a lot of time collecting this data, it's a very time consuming process, a very costly process. And to uh, using a non-cloud solution, process this for several days and then find out that the data wasn't corrected, collected correctly, or wasn't collected over the right region, it's very costly and time consuming to go out and do a recollect. So that's kind of looking at it the non-cloud way. So leveraging the Snowball Edge capability, which allows us to do some processing on site, allows us to um, understand, do some initial analysis on the data to figure out if, if it's valid data and we've co collected it correctly so we can then validate that and then do further processing in the cloud to get a higher fidelity solution out of it. So we wanted to kind of a first pass sanity check to make sure the data was collected properly, uh, it was collected over the right region, uh, it has good image quality so that it's suitable for, for more robust analysis. So by doing some edge processing on the snowball itself allowed us to save that time and money of having to go back days later and do another recollect over the same area. We can go back the same day and collect new imagery over the entire region if necessary or just part of the region to make sure we have all the right data and it's valid uh, for sending it to the cloud and then doing further robust processing at scale. So we, tr uh, so we tried this in uh, Australia um, and it worked. And then we tried it again in, um, um, in, in our neighborhood in, in Northern Virginia. And uh, the output, we kind of got together, spent some time, and, and, um, and let's hit play. And this is what we achieved. This is our, our, this is our architecture. This is our, the work that we did. Um, so we, uh, so Steve configured the, the snowball and shipped it um, to the location on the edge where we had all the data. And, you know, it was literally start, start this thing up, um, unlock it. Uh, so there is a host of layers of security built in uh, just so that if someone else get ac gets access to, to the snowball, they are unable to get into it. Um, uh, of course, uh, we went through the authorization process. Um, 
and then we um, we load it up with um, the massive data set and then um, um, uh, we literally perform the um, the the anal analytics on the on the snowball using the snowball edge tool sets that are available um, just so that we could generate a three dimensional model from our high accuracy photogrammetry payload which has a capacity of 100 megapixels covering a massive region so this is an open pit mine which is you know in in the kilometers um, you know, one of these dots would be a, a really massive truck about half the size of this room. Uh, so you can think in terms of scale. And then of course, after the content was processed, uh, we moved it back into the snowball so that it could be shipped back onto the AWS Sydney data center. As soon as it appeared there, now we are able to pick it up anywhere in the world. So these were the steps that we followed and at the end of the day, um, the, the folks left happy. Um, we actually, in, you know, just for sanity, you know, we were surprised, wow, you know, this worked. So we tried the, the same thing again. We covered a really large region um, near Brisbane, Australia, where uh, we captured a whole bunch of data, ran it through the, uh, the 2.5D algorithm that, um, that one of our, our um, um, uh, image scientists has developed and, uh, and, and again, same thing. You, we are able to generate enough, um, enough val uh, validation of the data set. Um, and then, you know, ship it back and, and, and we are done. So the one thing which I wanted to point out here is that, you know, Steve was able to spend a lot of time at Amazon, spend a, a significant amount of, of, build those relationships with AWS folks, and we were able to, to, um, to achieve this through their help. We also used help uh, from a, a, a boutique uh, consulting firm called Asynchrony um, Worldwide Technologies. They are based out of, uh, based out of St. Louis. And uh, their team members got together with ours in a fully remote configuration. So um, um, you know, we, were able to, we were able to achieve this through the, through the relationships that we built with AWS and with, um, with our partners. So that was one thing which was a positive takeaway from this experience. And, and of course, what we were able to achieve was something pretty phenomenal. So let's see. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to invite all of our speakers to come back up on stage. We've got a couple of mics in the room and would love for you guys to, to step up to them and ask questions. We've got a few minutes for Q&A. As they're coming up, I want to give a quick plug to some new storage training that we've got out there that uh, counts towards some of your certifications. So if you're, if you're interested, go to AWS. Uh, www.aws.training. There are also some folks here around here at reInvent that you can talk to about those, those different things. Um, so with that, we'll open the floor to questions. Any questions? All right. Well, no questions. I guess you guys did a great job. Uh, if you have questions and you just didn't want to ask them out in, out in uh, public, then feel free to come down front or meet us outside the room. And these guys will hang around and we'll answer any questions that we can. Thanks for spending the time today.